beginning at verse 23. For I delivered from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament, or the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other, if anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further instruction. We find in this passage of scripture, Paul the Apostle addressing the Christians that were in the city of Corinth. Of all of the churches that Paul had relationship with, this was his worst church. It was a church that was loose. It was a seaport city. Something like the place where I'm from, from New Orleans. Whenever you have ships coming in from different uh, places in the world, you have a whole lot of immorality. They were known to be a loose people. As a matter of fact, it meant that if you were a Corinthian, you were a fornicator. That's what it meant. And so when Paul came to Corinth, he preached the gospel and power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. And many of the Corinthians came to know Christ. He stayed with them for a number of years ministering to them. And you would think that since he was there preaching and teaching, they would grow up in their spiritual lives. But to the contrary, many of them remain carnal. Many of them remain babies. And he said to them in the third chapter, I would want to give you meat, but you can't handle it. The only thing that I can give to you is milk because you are immature. What I want to talk about this morning is the need for self examination. The scripture tells us in two places that we are to examine ourselves. In the passage we read, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5, it says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, except ye be disqualified. Paul in two places said to the same people, you need to take a self-examination. I can remember when I took a class at the University of Chicago, I had a, a pretty mean professor. And part of my grade was writing a, a paper and, and presenting the paper in class. When I made the presentation in class, she cut me off. I wasn't allowed to finish. And I just knew I failed her class. But when I received the grade, I got an A on the exam and an A out of the class. And I thought I would get <laughs> much less. 
But I think we ought to take an examination. There were many in, in college we had to take. We had the multiple choice examinations. We had fill in the blank, true or false. And the one that we dreaded the most was the essay question. Because the professor would tell you, well, you're going to have eight questions you need to be prepared to answer, but only two are going to be on the exam. So that meant you had to study all eight. You had to prepare to answer all eight. And it would have been better if he would have said, well, these are the only two questions that are going to be on the test. He wanted you, the professors wanted you to study everything, know everything, and be prepared to answer. I think that the Christian ought to take a self-examination, that there ought to be some tests that we take as believers to see whether or not we are in the faith. To see whether or not we have the real thing. Because I believe that it's the tendency of human beings to believe that they can work their way to heaven. That they can somehow do good works and attain God's favor. The Jews came to Jesus in John chapter 6 verse 28 and they said, what works can we do? What work can we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus said, the only work that there is is to believe on the one whom the Father had sent. We, we have a tendency to believe that we can work our way into heaven. But you know what? We know that it's uh, otherwise because Jesus died on the cross. And if Jesus died on the cross, that means we couldn't do it in our human strength. We needed divine assistance. Abraham, what kind of salvation he had? He had the same kind of salvation we had. Because Abraham believed God. God told him, I want you to move. I want you to take all of your family and I want you to move from the earth of the Chaldees. I want you to leave and go to the place I want you to go. As a matter of fact, he told him, don't take anyone, but Lot went with him. Abraham believed when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. Abraham had the knife in the air. He believed God and he became a friend of God. He was justified. The law came some 430 years later. So it couldn't have been the Ten Commandments that would make him acceptable to God. Because they came 430 years later, according to Paul's writing to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 17. He used the prominent figure of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. If, if Abraham could have worked enough in order to receive God's favor, he would have had something to boast about. He would have something to brag about. Well, I did it. I did this. I did that. And that's why God should save me. No. But God demonstrated his favor and grace to Abraham. What does grace mean? Grace means that you receive divine favor. You receive divine approval. As I look at the scripture, I would say that in order for a person to be accepted by God, they have to be just as righteous as God is. And guess what? None of us have arrived. None of us will be as holy as God is. So therefore, God had to do something. He had to send his son. And his son, giving us righteousness, was able to declare us righteous. Just as God is. So somebody took our place. Somebody became our substitute. Jesus did. Because we can do it. What kind of salvation did David have? In Romans 4 verse 6. Even as David has described the blessedness of the man. Unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. This righteousness comes without works. God declares us to be righteous. God declares us to be acceptable to him. And then in Galatians chapter 2 verse 16, Paul says to the Galatians, 
knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. The only thing the Ten Commandments were designed to do was to show you and I that we could not keep it, that we were sinful, that we were unholy. The Ten Commandments pointed us to Christ. But people, the Jews in which Jesus ministered to in, in that day, they believed that they could keep the law and, and because of their lineage that they would be accepted by God. But on the contrary, Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No flesh can be made right with God on the basis of doing works. Well, when we look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, the Christian is not saved by doing good works, but guess what? The Christian ought to have good works. Your life ought to be characterized by good works. It's like a coin. On one side you have faith, and on the other side you have works. You can't have faith without works. James says, faith without works is dead. They must go together. So he says, if it were through works, we would have something to boast about. We would take the credit, but, but this was designed by God, this plan to give us grace in order to save us through our faith in God. Then we look in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 it says, Who hath saved us and called us unto a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Titus 2 and verse 7 says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity and sincerity. We find that it is not through works that we are saved, but because we are saved, we do good works. Well, Titus chapter 3, verse 3 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in madness and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the old you. Verse 4, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior towards men appear, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. Now we find here that there is a transition, that there is an old life and there's a new life. Your old life was characterized by foolishness, by being disobedient, by being deceived by your lust and by your pleasures, by living in malice and envy, by living in hate, mm, mm, mm. hating one another. This is the old you. If this is your character, if this is more prominent in your life, then maybe you haven't had a change. The new life ought to take preeminence. 
because the Lord has shown to us his kindness and his love through Jesus Christ. The Christian cannot be the same way. When you have Christ in your life, there has to be a change. Somebody said it this way. If Jesus could come into your life and you not know it, he could leave and you won't even miss it. Every life in which Jesus comes in, he makes a change. There is a change that takes place in the life. You begin to think differently. You begin to talk differently. Your values become different. When you are in Christ, well, I believe that there are at least seven tests that we can take to determine whether or not we're in the faith. Jesus said on the Sermon of the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. The first test, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What kind of righteousness did they have? They had a self-righteousness. Their righteousness was based on following rules and regulations. Their righteousness was based on taking care of the outer man. Just make sure it looks good on the outside. But Jesus said, you have heard them say of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman to commit lust with her in his heart, he has already committed adultery. Jesus said, this is not on the outside. This thing is on the inside. It's a matter of the heart. If you have Christ in your life, you shouldn't even be thinking that way. Whereas Jews, they were focusing on what you do on the outside. Jesus said it shouldn't even be on the inside. Your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Then we have to realize that there is none righteous. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 gives us a description of man. This is how man is described. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seek it after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that do it good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is how man is described. There is no way that a person being described like this could have a righteousness in and of themselves. We are all under sin. Guess what? the Christian is called to be different. And I don't believe that a Christian could be sinless, but I do believe that a Christian, as they grow in their relationship with Christ, should be sinning less and less. Because when Jesus comes in your life, he makes a change. There is none righteous. So God said, I'm going to declare everyone unrighteous so that I can declare all those who believe on Jesus as righteous. So righteousness comes through believing that Jesus is the Christ and that he died for our sins. He died in our stead. And God raised him on the third day. It says in verse 24 of that same chapter, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It comes through believing that Jesus died in my place and God raised him from the dead. So he says in verse 27, where is boasting? It is excluded. We don't have anything to brag about. Guess what? If you don't have a problem with smoking, you ought to praise the Lord. But just remember, that your area may not be smoke and it may be lying. We can easily pride ourselves on what we don't do and what we see other people doing. 
But you know what? If it were not for the grace of God, we would be in that same position. I have a, a habit of not thinking that I'm better than anyone. Because I know that we are all sinners. We're all messed up. See, I know that. I, I know that there isn't anyone in this room that's better than I am because we are all sinners. But guess what? We should be striving to be more and more like Christ. We should be striving. The third test is that our lives should not be characterized by sin. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Is that in your Bible? If it's not, you can look in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says the same thing. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, it says the same thing. If your life is characterized by these, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look what it says in verse 11. And such were some of you, past tense. That's how you used to be. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. I like that word. <laughs> I like that word. That means when I was all dirty and all messed up, God washed me. <laughs> but ye are sanctified. I'm already sanctified. Because right? I'm already sanctified. But sanctification, my friend, is going to show itself up as I walk with Christ. But ye are sanctified. You are set aside for the master's you. He wants to do a work in you. Guess what? We have to allow him to do that. We looked at on Wednesday night, the last church that Jesus addressed in the book of Revelation, the church at Laodicea, where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open up, I will come into him. Fellowship with him. Jesus did not say that to unbelievers. He said that to the church. So that, guess what? That lets me know that there are believers who don't enjoy the fellowship with Jesus Christ. And guess what? I believe that, that if we cloud our lives, if we pile our lives up with junk, we're going to be uncertain about our salvation. We're not going to be sure of what the Lord wants to do in our lives. We're just going to be wishy-washy and we're just going to be blown with every wind and doctrine that comes up. If we crowd our lives with junk, when we go to produce, all we're going to produce is junk. Guess what? My grandfather always used to tell me, said, boy, I know, I know who you are by the company you keep. You show me your company and I'll show you who you are. Guess what? If, I, if I'm hanging with people and they're not helping me to grow in my relationship, guess what? We can't hang. Because I'm serious about this thing. If you're not going to be moving in the right direction, we can't hang. Because I don't need anybody that's going to slow me down or get in my way because I want to be more and more like Jesus. So we got to watch out the company that we keep. Your life should not be characterized by sin because that's how you used to be. But there's been a change that has taken place. Look at uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 16. False believers, they profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him. See, our works are going to show who we are. The fourth test that we should take is separation from the world. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. There must be a separation. Because without holiness, we will not see the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. What is the world? The world is that organized system headed by sin. 
And basically the philosophy of the world is leave God out of your life. You don't need God. There are many other substitutes that are just as good as God. Leave God out. That's the worldly mind. And the worldly mind is always concerned about satisfying the flesh and satisfying the eyes and satisfying the pride of life. But this is not of the Father. This is of the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a change that takes place. You're not the same. The fifth test that we should take is, do we love our fellow Christians? Oh, God. 